All right, and other computer should be this. All right, so plan for today is lesson nine. Uh, the, today is the due date for lesson eight from last time, which is just another code.org assignment. And anytime you see an assignment that has no submission, that just means you are, you need to do the activity in code and I will check your code.org account for it. If it doesn't say check for understanding, um, that means I'm not going to grade it, but you still will benefit from doing it and we'll go over it in class at some point. The key is making sure you get the activities done. We'll do it in class together. And as long as there's no major technical issues, we will, we will have a recording of it. So let us jump right in. Um, also, so the links on the spreadsheet are to the Google Slides, which have the class videos on them so that you can access them from whatever device. If it, so this is where today's recording is gonna be, uh, but this one is the link to the code.org video from lesson nine which is actually like bubble two um, because sometimes people can't access the uh, YouTube video from there. So I'm gonna put it in here, but this is the actual lesson video that doesn't exist yet. All right, so lesson nine. Oh, one more thing. The uh, assignment, did I say that uh, is gonna be, lesson eight is gonna be the last assignment that goes on the first quarter, but we are gonna continue doing work. Um, it's just these grades will go on the second quarter. Those of you who are new here, that's pretty common practice because we've got to get grades in. And uh, yeah, all right. So guys, I do need you to pay attention. Put your phones away. Thank you. Lesson nine, loops. And well, looping and random numbers. The, we had a brief thing about random numbers last time, but the concept of loops, we talked about how functions were one of maybe three or four major concepts in computer science. Loops is one of them. Loops are one of them. The concept of loops is one of those major concepts. There are several different types of loops. They come in different forms, but the key and the lots of different uses, but the key is that it's, you're telling the computer to do the same thing over and over again for a certain number of times or until something happens or for every item in a list, do it, no matter how long the list is, whether it's shorter or longer than what you started with, it's about repeating things for a specific purpose. The most common, or at least the first one that we'll talk about is a for loop. And that is, has, it has a specific syntax, meaning punctuation and words that go different places. And a variable is involved. There's a counting variable, but we haven't really talked about variables. So it's just sort of like provided to you. And, and the block that we end up using is, um, sort of guided so that you can't really mess that up. But let's go ahead and see what code.org has to say about it. And let's see if volume is good. My name is Jerome Holman and I work in the Windows Devices Group at Microsoft. Basically, a team where we build cool stuff. Phones, things like HoloLens that hopefully will excite and delight customers. Computers are not infinitely fast, but they are much faster than human beings at many tasks. In 2014, the fastest computer in the world was clocked in at an astounding 33 quadrillion calculations per second. Now, for some tasks like composing a song, we generally think human beings still do a better job. For highly repetitive tasks that can be automated, computers are much, much better. Programming languages 
you usually have a few different ways to define and control behavior that should repeat. These are usually called loops. They go by different names and different languages like for loop, while loop, do while loop, for each loop, repeat loop, and so on and so forth. These types of loops have small differences, but all of them are just different ways to get the computer to execute some lines of code repeatedly. The generic term for looping is iteration. Iteration is just a fancy word that means repeat. It usually is in reference to the repetition of a process or a procedure. This is why iteration is a good generic term. Often in programming, we have an algorithm that just needs to repeat a specific number of times, or a repeated while some condition holds true. We're going to show you how to use a looping structure called a for loop in JavaScript. You can find for loops in the control section of the toolbox. It looks like this when you drag it out. A for loop in JavaScript, like this one, is just a type of counter loop. It counts up from zero to the number you type in. Why does this simple for loop look so complicated? JavaScript, unlike some languages, doesn't provide a simple repeat loop structure. The for loop is a very powerful and versatile looping structure for both advanced and simple tasks. We're just keeping it simple for now. Let's do a little experimentation. You can drag any commands you like inside the for loop block. These commands will be executed over and over for however many times you specify in the loop. When you run the loop, notice the app lab highlights each line as it executes. Now why does the for loop block highlight after each iteration of the loop? That's because the for loop needs to check its counter every time to see if it should stop or run the commands inside the loop one more time. Well, that's not terribly exciting, but it's because we're not really using the computing power that looping gives us. Instead of looping this piece of code four times, let's loop it, I don't know, 200 times and see what happens. Now that's more interesting. One thing to note about loops is that your code will still execute from top to bottom as before. You can put lines of code before the loop if you need to get something set up before the loop starts. Likewise, after the loop is done executing, it will pick up on the line right after the loop. For example, if you want to move the turtle before drawing this figure, I could use a move to command before the loop. And if I want to draw a red dot to see where the turtle ends up, I could add lines after the loop. You will use the same top-down design in many of your projects. These problem-solving techniques will help you identify where loops belong in your code. You still might want to write a function to do a small part of your program, and then write a loop to call that function. Take, for example, the problem of trying to draw this. You might recognize that this is just a bunch of squares, each one rotated slightly before being drawn. Previously, we would have had to make a function to draw a square. To get the 10 rotating squares, we would have had to call this function 10 times, turning a little each time after we called the function. This would have involved a lot of copying and pasting. This code works, it does, but it's very repetitive. Let's just see if we can simplify our code with a loop. We already have a working function that does a piece of the problem once. We can easily stick the function call into a loop to do it multiple times. Clarity and readability are important considerations when programming. As we can see, this code is now much more readable. It's obvious just from looking at the loop that the intent is to draw a square a bunch of times. Loops are a powerful programming construct that uses the computer's primary advantage over humans, that being their amazing speed. By repeating commands as many times as we wish, loops allow us to solve new problems at a scale that would be impossible without computers. There is still much to learn about the loop, but the concept is simple. 
loops repeat commands as many times as we need. Now you know how to use a simple loop. You can use them in your programs and take advantage of your computer's power and speed. That was painful. All right, uh, go ahead and turn screens back on, laptops up. Continue paying attention. All right, again, make sure that when you're done with the bubbles, which they call challenges, I guess, um, you hit finish to double check that you're doing it right also to make sure you get a cloud save so that I can grade it. All right, so let's get started with loops. First one, we're gonna make switch to the control uh, toolbox and let's do bring out just a basic for loop and let's do a move forward in there. And this is just repeating what they had in the um, video there, um, which let's see, move forward. For some reason, 137 is what they're working with. And um, I guess for this one, we are just experimenting with the um, concepts and um, for loop, drag a for loop out and turn left. I mean, it's not critical. The idea is that you see that there's a different block for loop and the only text entry for the um, for loop is the number of times to iterate or repeat. Um, we can talk about how var i gets zero while i is less than 100 i plus plus. We'll talk about that more when we get into variables and later into uh, more advanced loops and what this is actually counting. But for now, you just need to know that the blank there is how many times to do it and so on. Okay, so let's go on to the next bubble. All right, so we have a function called draw square. It appears to, we can assume it works. It receives a parameter size. I had a lot of people somewhat confused about how parameters work. The definition gets the word. That word needs to be used inside the definition. The call gets the number, assuming it is a number variable. You could have a variable be anything, I mean, a, a parameter be anything, it could be a, a function, it could be a, you know, a return function, it could be a very, it could be anything. But the idea is that the parameter is sending the value, the depth, excuse me, the function call, its parameter is sending a value to the function definition that is receiving it and attaching it to that word. But that's not what we're doing here. I mean, it is what we're doing but uh, that was the lesson from last time. So let's have a for loop. Let's put our function in there. We need to make sure we name the function call, what the definition is. Let's give it a, a parameter. Let's send the definition a parameter. It looks like hundred is good. And let's also have it turn right, uh, what did it say, 10? 10. 10 is fine. And how many times should we do it? Uh, we want 72 squares, uh, 72 of these. And you'll notice that the default location of the uh, tortoise and hare slider is farther over. Um, before when you moved in, it would be like right here. And that's just ridiculous you pretty much can go all the way to the end and have it happen instantly. Maybe just a slight bit less to see what's actually happening. Uh, but this is what we are looking for. I don't know, all the way over to five. And short answer, um, for the, the sort of short answer things, we'll go over them together, but I do want you to answer them. Okay, in one to two sentence, explain what you think the following code does. Well, uh, 
we've done random numbers slightly shortly before at the end of the first under the sea drawing where we had random colors for fish. You can see that, well, just working through this, we have a for loop that's going to do something 100 times. And what is it going to do 100 times? It's going to pick a set the pen color to a random red, random green, random blue at this opacity. It's going to move to a random location. And you'll notice, hopefully remember, the reason why the first random number in the move to is 0 to 320, and the second one is 0 to 450. So clearly, this is written for App Lab. And hopefully, you remember that any one of these red, green, or blue values has to be 0 to 255 because that's the full range of uh, each of those three channels, the three color channels, and then a dot of a random size. So essentially put the things that I said into sentence form and don't overthink it, just go ahead and do it. Uh, did I just do this? Um, all right, so I guess this is what you start with. Okay, uh, looping in random values. Uh, random dot do this, figure out how many iterations you need to consistently fill up the screen with dots, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you need a, a number that is large enough to cover it up um, every time, but okay, so just with 100, which is what they give us, definitely doesn't cover up the screen. Let's see what a thousand does just because we're there. That's pretty good, but not quite. Maybe 4,000. Uh, it kind of seems a little bit redundant to have you go through and figure out, well, 4,000 does it. Does 2,500 do it? And to try to figure out, like, the 2,500 didn't do it that time. So, uh, I don't know, play around with it. There's another way you could do this and make, you could make the dots bigger. Uh, but that's not what they want. Uh, well, 2,000 does work. Yeah. Well, I just did. I just did 2,500, and it didn't work. But that's because of you know randomness. The sizes are random, and the locations could miss or cover each thing. Uh, I mean, you, did you rerun it and see if you have any background? Like, just see it keep hitting or hit reset and run again not not super critical let's go on to the next one and uh is this is this what we just did oh yeah it is let's go to i don't know why when you guys went to this one did it go to text or is it still in blocks I got you. I'm just double checking that yours did that also because sometimes when you leave a particular challenge or bubble in text, when you come back to it, it'll be in text and sometimes it won't. Unclear. All right. So some repeated tasks can be easy to solve with a single loop. Um, instead, you'll need uh, one loop after another, each one solving a part of the problem. Add a loop to fill the screen with semi-transparent white dots until it gets erased. Okay, so right now we have something that pretty much usually fills up the screen. Let's do a different loop. You can just copy and paste it, except we need to make sure all of the dots are white, which means we don't want a random value for red, a random value for green, a random value for blue. We want them all to be maxed out. 255, 255, 255 is the RGB for white. We want the maximum red, maximum green, maximum blue. 
I suppose technically you could, um, that says with 0.05, uh, but let's see what happens. So it goes, it does the entire thing with the color dots and then it goes over. If you have this, I guess it's enough iterations that the computer, even if you have it all the way slid over to fastest, it doesn't do it instantly. Uh, but either way, we do need to increase. And there you go. So the point of this is that it's completing all of the first loop iterations and then going on to the second set of loop iterations or the second set of, yeah, second set of iterations. And that's the point of that one. Oh, uh, am I not filling it in? Oh, did it not get to the end? Oh, yeah. Uh, you do have to run things in order for it to uh, check if it is a challenge that is actually checking for them for something. We'll get to challenges later where it will say, are you sure you're finished? And then you can say, yep. All right. So here we have a, hold on, let's see if, what you actually start with. Okay. Yeah, there we go. All right. So this under the C challenge is a um, an example of abstraction or it's going to have several examples of abstraction generally it's a good idea when you get to a new challenge just hit a run and see what happens a lot of the times it's going to break and that's fine you'll know it doesn't work at that point it's unlikely that you get to a challenge and it will be set up with something that will break um, you can write code that is it, like something that's an infinite loop and it will break your, it will break Chrome, not permanently break, but it will freeze it and you'll have to refresh and that sort of thing. Um, it's actually not that hard to do if you don't know what you're doing. Um, so, but generally it's a good problem solving strategy. When you get to a new bubble, just see what we have. And you can look at what, we are going for. And you can see that there are, you're starting out with one fish, one starfish, one seagrass, and one light beam, and one bubble, apparently. And they're coming up in random locations, random sizes. Let's see if I can get a light beam. Um, if you remember from last time, the uh seagrass always started from the bottom so it was a random location mm. i can't answer that right now oh well um a random location on the bottom but it's a random location left to right but it's always on the bottom and uh the other ones are the seagrass or the starfish is random but always it always ends up sort of below this level, the, um, the fish can end up anywhere, I think. And the sunbeam always starts at the top, but they're all always different sizes, but within a normal range. And uh, let's get at it. Okay, so what do we have? Well, we have some functions that are, well, we have draw background, which is gonna be, um, down here just makes the background dark blue with a dot that's large enough. And you'll see that we have functions called draw all seagrass, draw all stars, draw all fish, draw all bubbles, draw all sunbeams. There are five components, not counting the background. And we have inside of the draw all for each of them, we have a move to a random location that we like and something needed to set it up. Seagrass always needs to be pointed due north in order for it to work in this case. And the lower level function. So this is abstraction. The higher level function is draw all, whatever the component is. And the lower level function is draw one or just draw a. And uh, here's a brief tour, high level functions, low level functions that receive parameters. Uh, run the code, and that's all we're doing here is just making sure we know what's going on. 
and okay bubble nine we are going to do the draw all bubbles first and let's take a look at the high level and low level function the high level draw all bubbles is it sends it to a random number and the random range is the full amount of x zero to 320 and the full amount of y zero to 450 which is not the case later on and then we draw a the high level function calls the low level function and passes it a parameter let's see what that parameter does so we'll go to the lower level draw bubble draw bubble receives that parameter and attaches it to the word size and then it uses that word or the parameter coming through to change the dot size it always has the same color which is a mostly blue but very light and very transparent color and what are we actually supposed to do add a loop inside the function in the add a loop inside the high level function the draw all so let's go ahead and put a loop inside of draw all which if you're keeping track with line numbers I can say add it to line 35, but if you're jumping all over the place, um, the line number won't apply to you. Um, because obviously, if we did, if you went ahead and did the loop for draw all fish before I did, it's on a different line. But uh, yeah, so I'm adding it here. And we need to put the commands of draw one bubble and the move to inside of the loop. And let's see what 200 bubbles gets us. And see what happens. There we go. There's some bubbles. You'll notice that they are different sizes, and they are different sizes because every time it loops through, it reruns, I should say it runs the, the random number. So each time you loop, you're actually getting a new random number as the parameter and as the move to. So there's that. And I think that's it, not too hard. That's an easy one. Bubble 10. Okay, draw fish. Draw fish has a few more parameters. Let's go to the low level. It says go look at the low level draw fish, which is for me down on line 91. Draw fish receives four parameters. The first one, whatever you put in the function call inside of parentheses, it's expecting four comma separated values. The first, whatever you put in the first one will be applied to the word size, which is already given to you. We'll set pen width. It will set dot size, which is the head. It will set how far back the tail starts. And the tail, if you recall, is a bunch of triangles that will move forward that same value, whatever you put in. And the three other values are the amount of red, the amount of green, the amount of blue. When, I, when we did lesson eight, I called the, the values redness, greenness, and blueness, uh, just to make sure that you know that you can name your parameters anything. And sometimes it's safer to not use words that you would consider common because they might be reserved words. Although if you do use, use a reserved word inappropriately, it will let you know very quickly. Um, but regardless, whatever value you put in, the second, third, and fourth will be applied to the color. And it's expecting, because this block, pen RGB, is expecting three numbers. The whatever number gets passed in the second parameter is a number that we want between zero and 255 because it's going to be put in the first slot of pen RGB, even though it's the second, third, and fourth of our function definition. Okay. And so we need to go up to the higher level, the draw all fish, 
which is draw all fish. And we're going to add a loop. And let's put all of the other parts in here. And let's see here. Does it already have? Um, what we're looking for. Oh yeah, we need a couple hundred of these. Is that what it says? Uh, 15 fish, 200 is a lot of fish. Although I don't think it's checking that. There we go. And you can see here, so the size of the fish for the dot and the move forwards is random between five and 20. The other three values, the redness, greenness, and blueness are given random numbers, but they're not all random zero to 255 because they want, and you want, the fish to be in um, like a color palette, but also different. And, um, so the random amount of red is a random number, but it's a random and it's locking it into a very high amount of red. It's choosing a random number in a medium amount of green. And it's not choosing a random number. It's sticking uh, blue at approximately halfway. And um, the other key to note here is that the move two isn't zero to 320 and zero to 450. It is zero to 320 on the X, meaning the move two is always going to, or it's going to be somewhere in here. And because the fish face this way, if the, the X, this random X, is somewhere over here, some of the fish is going to be off of the visible area. It still exists, like these fish still exist, or their tails still exist, but it's going off the up random area. But the key is that the random amounts, the location of the fish top to bottom will never be below 300, which is somewhere like there. So the random y value of the move to, move to is somewhere between the top edge and 300, which out of 450 is 60% of the way down, I guess. So there's that. Choosing good random values that make sense or random ranges uh, is important moving forward if you want things to look a certain way, but also have the randomness going with them. Uh, place commands inside the function of your loop. Um, it says in the top 360, it says 300. Uh, no, wait, draw all fish. It says 360. I don't know. 320 is about the same thing. I don't think it's checking for that. And random size 5 to 20. It, I think it gives you most of that, but that's good for bubble 10. Let us proceed. Okay, draw C stars. Very similar to the last one as far as choosing a random Y value that keeps it at the bottom. First, let's go look at the low level draw a C star. Draw C star. Receives a single parameter that is size. And if you recall from before, the draw C star is just uh, lines that sort of go like this and turn a certain amount and go like that. And the value size is how long each of the lines are to make a different size C star. And it's always the same exact color. We're not sending a random value as a parameter. We're just the only parameter is size. So let's go take a look at the higher level. Draw all C stars. Let's uh, add a loop in there. Under control, add a loop, put our things in there. 
five C stars. So it's not very many. Random size is 10 to 30. It's already got that. And X value full width X of X, zero to 320. And Y value no higher than 360. So for this move two, it's going to pick a random number between 360, which is right there, and 450 is right there. So the starfish will never be above that one line, no matter how many times you random. And I think that's it for this one. Oh, uh, lab is expecting to see a what? Draw C star function. Oh, I didn't even read the thing. So in the draw C star, the singular, the lower level, um, you can see here it has a move forward, a parameter amount of pixels, and turn right 144. And it's doing the same thing five times. So why not loop that? We know we want that five times. So let's put one of them in there, switch it to five times, and get rid of the other one. What's up? Yes. And I think we're good there. Okay, right, we're wrapping it in the loop. You can see wrap, and I think that should do it. There we go. And bubble 12. Okay, seagrass, the lower level seagrass, draw a seagrass. Draw seagrass, receives a single parameter, which is radius, and it's the radius of one of the arcs. A larger radius means it will travel a greater distance. And uh, can I add a parameter? Okay, so this one, we are actually changing the function definition of the draw a seagrass, draw singular, we want to add a parameter that will uh, decide how many backs and forth is the seagrass each one has. And so we'll call it num waves. You can pretty much call it anything so long as it's not a reserved word and it starts with a lowercase letter and doesn't have spaces of punctuation. But let's stick with num waves. And this currently has a number of backs and forths equal to three, meaning left, right, three times, so six arcs total. But instead of exactly three, let's do it a num waves number of time. And then when we go up, to the function call of draw all seagrass, we need to add the parameter there. And this is where we're going to pass it a number, which will be a random number. And what is the number that we want our range? It says between two and 10, meaning. Uh, left, right, left, right, which is what the lowest range would be in 10 would be 10 backs and forths. Okay, so this should give us a different size. Okay, that one only has like two backs and forths. And so it's different sizes on several accounts, different size arcs and different number of backs and forths. And, um, a reasonable random value for the second parameter as well. Um, I think the next one is obviously we do want a large amount of actual seagrasses. And I think that's where we, I think we do that on the next one. This one is you just need to add a second parameter to the function call to send it a second parameter down to the low level function, which is receiving it and looping the left and right, whatever number comes through as the second parameter. 
And is this where we do that? Yeah. Okay. So in the draw all seagrass, we're going to put our new stuff inside its own loop. And so how many times do we want seagrass? I think we want 50 individual pieces of seagrass. And there you go. Every time it loops through, it's getting a random X location between zero and 320, which is the entire width. But the Y location is always 450, which will put the cursor somewhere on the bottom edge. Every time through the loop, after it chooses that, it makes a point due north. And then it calls the low level function, sending it one parameter between five and 20. And that's how big the arcs are. And the second parameter that we added is how many lefts and rights, which they'll all end on a left because the lower level function has arc right, arc left. But the number of times it goes back and forth also changes. And that is how I have paper towels, or you can go to the restroom. That is how you get a very large variance in number of seagrasses. And I wonder if we should do the next lesson also. Oh, all right. Oh, okay, sunbeams. So this is a, an important concept moving forward. And that is, and I mentioned this briefly, even though we can only see from zero to 320x and from zero to 450 on the y value, it exists, the program will keep track of things existing outside of the location. A lot of times, if you have something that is like falling, like if you're doing something with snowflakes or rain and it's moving, you will have it spawn somewhere in the negative Y value, meaning above the visible area, so that when it comes in, it actually comes in moving rather than spawning on the edge. So that is a very common concept. But here we want the sunbeam to all travel in a random location like this. But in order to get it all the way over, some of the sunbeams need to start with a negative X value. Otherwise, if we had the jump to be no lower than X is zero, this, there would be no sunbeams in this area. Let's see what it's actually asking. Okay, so let's go down to the draw a sunbeam, which is down at the bottom. Draw a sunbeam receives a value for size, which is how far the uh, sunbeam is. The pen width is a different size each time. The color is always white, but very translucent. A very low opacity, only 10% of its visibleness and it has a pen down and pen up for every time which is not a bad idea just to make sure you don't have the uh, pen drawing as it's resetting and let's look at the draw all sunbeams okay you can see it's random number the jump to location is, or the move to location has a negative X value um, between negative 50 and 320 is where the sunbeam starts. And it also has a random angle turn two, okay? Big difference between turn right, turn left and turn two, okay? Uh, remember zero degrees is due north, 180 is due south. So the random angle is somewhere between 175, 165, which is not a huge difference, but 
it still gives you the effect of the effect of this sort of well this effect let's loop through the draw all 100 times let's put everything in there and uh let's see what we have there looks pretty good um didn't it give you all this i feel like i reset all this when you got here did it already have the move to oh, they're not really challenging you if they give it to you still good to know what's going on and um I'm gonna do interesting things. Should we try and do? Um, no, we'll save this for next time. All right, so let's take a look at the checks for understanding. Um, I do want you to do them, but we are gonna just talk about them. So you need to pay attention. Um, all right, for bubble 15, listen up. There's one more thing. You need to change things to make it your own. I am going to check this. You can change any aspect of it, uh, numbers, colors, angles, uh, whatever you want. But if you don't like something and you want to go back, version history is super useful. It will give you the various cloud saves. You probably don't want to do start over because if you start over here, it actually starts over everywhere the lesson is tied to, which I think goes all the way back to like nine. Um, but you need to make something different about each component, either the range of colors, the number of the colors, something about it. And yeah, so it has the um, situation with um uh, version history okay so uh we talked about this briefly in the springtime there's an easy project that everyone's going to do and part of it is a written response and in order to prepare you for it some of the checks for understanding are sort of focused on that rubric and type of thing. This one is about choosing a, an example of abstraction. And this one has the students, um, somebody else's code, and you're checking to see whether, an, whether or not it satisfies the rubric for a, an abstraction and that it's student developed, meaning it can't be one of the functions that they give you, like move to or move forward. Okay, so which one of these is an example of simplification? Any guesses? Excellent on the participation. So, Square D is not any form of simplification. Think about how much it's repeating. This is not simplifying things. Um, B is just calling that. That doesn't simplify anything. A is a move to random. That's not student developed. So the answer is C. It is simplifying things by looping rather than doing something over and over. Okay, and so that's what you're answering, not just the letter C, but why it is C. Prove to me you know what you're talking about. Briefly. And just a second.
Okay, and the last two checks for understanding, or last three, I should say. Bubble seven. Okay, looking at the code here, which line of this code, guys, please stop talking. Like, if you're not going to pay attention, that's on you, but distracting other people is not okay. Okay, so looking at this code, if your goal is to do this loop over and over again. What is wrong with the code? Okay, you have draw eight squares, loops through, draw a square, move forward, turn right, and so on. And so that's the multiple draw eight squares calls draw square 25 uh, with a parameter 25. Draw one square receives that parameter as a distance. Um, what would be mentally traced to determine which line? uh what needs to be removed well work through the loops which would i'll give you a hint there's an extra turn in there that wouldn't set it up push and bubble 18 digging out a problem you often encounter elements you want repeatedly code sometimes it's appropriate to write a new function other times write a loop hey uh, folks talking I'm going over the answers you need to type in. Okay, so listen for your own sake and stop distracting me. Pretty please. Okay, when breaking down a problem, you often call elements you want repeatedly uh, repeat in your code. Sometimes you'd want to write a new function, other times write a loop. There's no hard and fast rule, which is better. What circumstances? Okay, somebody please tell me what differences a function has over a loop what advantages a function has over a loop if you're trying to do something over and over again and what advantages does a loop have in other words what are their major differences anybody awesome okay so uh a function can receive parameters so something can be done differently every time a loop can be done uh a lot more times rather than having draw square a hundred times, you could just loop through the components a hundred times, put that number in the loop. But anything in a loop is going to be done exactly the same way every time through the loop, assuming you don't put a random value in a parameter. Uh, so that's a disadvantage of a loop over a function. Functions receive parameters. And uh, describe using how top-down approach, meaning our abstraction of solving, if you recall the way we solved, I think draw snowflake from a few lessons ago, where we just started by calling the function draw snowflake, even though we had no other code, then broke that down into smaller components and that and so on, that's top-down. And uh, how you draw a white snowflake on blue background with random numbers, and how it would be unique each time, okay? That's a major concept from this lesson and previous, okay? Just general concepts for that, okay? Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Let me uh, end the meeting so I can 